kind of draw our minds to a certain theme this evening as we begin uh, our business meeting this way, and it's in Ephesians 6, 10 through 19. It says this, Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. I'm going to pause there for now and just want to draw your attention to this passage of scripture this, uh, this evening. A serious message on uh, this portion of scripture was assigned by its preacher a very catchy title. And the title was this, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. You with me? Not don't stand there, do something. It's don't do something, stand there. And that's what Paul's message is in a way, isn't it? It's to stand. It's to stand. This captures something of the sentiment of Paul's exhortation to be strong in the Lord and to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, some of us get caught up in the chase of, of what I have to get done every day, we must ask ourselves how we are standing while we are doing in the faithfulness of the Lord. Are we standing while we're worried about what we're doing, or are we just chasing what we need to do and not focused on standing firm? Of course, the catchy title is not just a call, to, however, to inaction as if doing things for the Lord is more spiritual. Or, or, or doing less things, rather, for the Lord is more spiritual. Doing less for the Lord is not necessarily more spiritual. Standing is certainly necessary and is spiritual. Just as by focusing too much on doing, we can fall short of standing and faithfulness as well if we are lazy and get up, give up the fight, right? So the focus is not so much on don't do or don't not do, it's on stand. And stand is not a word of inaction, but it's not a word also that permits you to say, well, if I just keep on do, 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 work, 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 work for the Lord, or so-called for the Lord, then I'm, I'm actually doing what God wants me to do. If you're not standing firm in the faith of the gospel. So the Apostle Paul wants us to stand. He says, first of all, he, he talks about the power of God in verses 10 to 13, and then he talks about the armor of God in verses 14 and following, and it's the armor that allows you to display and exhibit the power of God. That's how the two sections kind of fit together. And so Paul says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And in, in isolation, you might say to yourself, well, what in the world does that mean? How do I do that? Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You know, we don't want to uh, teach or preach here a message which just kind of says that and then leaves it to you to you know, kind of muddle through and or just feel like, oh, this, I just get to feel the spirituality of that, you know, and just feel really good. I'm going to be strong for the Lord. Um, how is it that you are strong for the Lord? Well, he says in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. So standing is being strong for the Lord. Put on that armor so that you might be able to do that. Now, the armor is not discussed until four verses later in verse 14, but we're going to 
carry on with the flow of the text here. Instead of jumping to the armor, we're going to just look at these verses for one moment, and then we'll get to the armor. How you are strong in the Lord is to put on that whole armor of God. And this is how you stand against the stratagems of the devil. He is a wily coyote, okay? He is uh, deceitful and crafty. His schemes, his strategies are that way. And it takes the whole package of Christian virtues, which is the armor of God, the whole package of Christian virtues to stand up against his wiles. If you have a chink in your armor, don't get turned around by the metaphor, you know, like you're lacking something in truth and righteousness and the gospel and so on as we'll look at, then he will take advantage of it. You can count on it. We must recognize that also, if you look at verse number 12, where it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our real enemies are not politicians. Our real enemies are not lawyers. Our real enemies are not tech companies. Our real enemies are not social influencers. Viruses are not our true foe. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It is demonic powers at the core of what is going on behind the scenes. This is what makes friendly fire so dumb, you know, sniping at each other as believers. Um, sniping at other decent believers is worse than a waste of time. It's so, so damaging. And even attacking people who are unbelievers, blind pawns of the system. I, I say system, not like uh, the political system, but the demonic system. These, these poor souls who are blind pawns of the system, you know, attacking them is of no use. They need the Lord. It's something else behind the scenes that our wrestling is against. After everything is said and done, the next verse says, well, yeah, in verse 13, take up the whole armor of God, he says again, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I find it interesting, he's got really two tenses there, of standing. One is presently that you will be able to withstand in the evil day. When is that? <laughs> today, tomorrow, yesterday, next week. It's today that you would be able to withstand right now and after your whole timeline is done and you're at the end of your days that it would be able to be said of you, that believer withstood in the evil day and did everything, and at the end of the day, he was standing. She was standing, had not faltered, had not failed. And so, God, we pray, please keep us from failure, keep us from falling as individuals, as a church, as families, as young people, as older saints, may we stand. Don't just do something. Stand there. Be faithful to the truth that God has revealed. And so we have the power of God. How do you be strong in his power? You, you put on the whole armor of God and you recognize that you can't waste your power, your energy on friendly stuff. You've got to focus on the fact that it's against not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. That's what that word refers to. It's angelic stuff. It's the realm of the demons, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness, all that. That's how we have the power of God. But we have to put on the whole armor, and that's what verses 14 to 19 talk about. And uh, the Apostle Paul is obviously thinking about uh, soldier's armor, which looks a little different uh, back then than it does today. You know, we'd probably be talking about the flak jacket of truth or the, you know, the uh, whatever, bulletproof vest of righteousness. But uh, you get the idea. Don't let the, the, the metaphor confuse the matter at all. There are seven vital pieces of armor which are characteristics of the life of the believer. And I, now, I just ran over that quickly. Let me say it again. There are seven pieces of armor, and those armor pieces are vital characteristics of the believer. So when the Apostle Paul says that you put on 
you, you gird yourself with truth around the waist, we call the belt of truth, what is that? It is truth, simple, okay? So drop the metaphor in your mind, and when you read it, just read it that way. When he says, uh, verse 14, girding your waist with truth, that's it. It's not a belt, it's truth. Or putting on the breastplate of righteousness, it's not a breastplate, it's righteousness, okay? Don't reverse. See, what people do is they kind of reverse it, and they talk about They emphasize the breastplate. They emphasize the belt. They emphasize the shoes. And they talk a lot about the metaphor of the soldier, but the, the emphasis really is on the truth and the righteousness. And whatever the item of armor is made of, that's what God wants us to grasp a hold of, okay? So we have the truth. The truth of God's Word protects us and gives us power. That's what Paul's trying to get across from verse 10, right? Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. If you don't have truth, you're going to be weak. I mean, look at all the churches that have some, you know, label of church, but they have no truth. Or key aspects of the truth are omitted. Where's their power for God? It's not. What about righteousness? You see that? The breastplate of righteousness Saved people have the imputed righteousness of Christ, and some limit this to that, but I think it includes the broader idea of righteousness that includes practical righteousness. You cannot live in sin and expect God's power in your life. Can you? No. It doesn't normally operate that way. Righteousness... Uh, a holiness in life is super important and required for us as we live for God and seek His power and His might. Thirdly, you have your gospel of uh, peace shoes, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is picturesque. It's, uh, this is the gospel, which is the good news of God, that there's peace between God and man made available in Christ Jesus. That's what we stand on, isn't it? So the, the feet, the shoes is a, is a nice metaphor. If we're not standing on the real gospel, it doesn't matter what else we're doing or not doing. Uh, and it's not going to matter at the end if, if somebody says, yeah, he's still standing on the wrong gospel. Like, oops, you know, you're at the wrong place, mister. Wrong, wrong phone number, wrong address shouldn't have been there. That's not, that doesn't count as true standing. We must stand on the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Then Paul says, uh, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. This is going to, this faith is going to help you conquer all the attacks of the devil who throws problems and doubts and trials and difficulties and temptations and discouragements in your pathway. Why does he do that? I mean, imagine yourself, you know, trotting down the hallway of life and somebody's in the side rooms pitching out like bowling balls and, you know, marbles and all kinds of stuff trying to make you slip and fall down. That's what the devil's doing. That's what these principalities and powers are doing. So you must have faith to be able to carry you through all of those things lest you stumble. Believe in God, believe in Christ. They will carry you through the difficult days and the good days too. And then Paul says, as we look at the rest of this armor for the power of God, take the helmet of salvation. That speaks of assurance, the helmet, a protecting element for the head, the mind, as protects your mind against the brain games of the devil. You know that? He, he, does, he does that sort of thing uses the flesh, external stimuli, your thoughts can bother you, uh, things try to get into your head, so to speak, the helmet of salvation. Number six, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now this is like the truth that we mentioned, the belt of truth before, but it's a little different. It's the specific particular words sayings, statements, propositions, verses, truths, values, etc. You know, it's not enough to say, oh, I read the Bible. 
No, do you know the Bible? That's why we have our young people memorize the Bible. It's crucial for them to have that foundation. And what better time to do it than when their minds are like sponges and can just soak it right up and they can memorize it so easily. And then finally, and that's the sword of the Spirit. You've got to be familiar with your Bible. You have to be if you're going to have the power of God. And then finally, in the last two verses, praying always with all prayer and supplication, watchful, all perseverance, supplication for all the saints, prayer. Prayer is part of the armor of God. I don't know. He kind of drops the uh, metaphor, doesn't he? He has the helmet of salvation, then just goes right to prayer. He doesn't tell us that it's some other you know, piece of armor. Uh, but we need it. Pastor Perry Reddy, who is a missionary we've supported for years in South Africa, was fond of saying, you cannot get far without prayer. You cannot get far without prayer. I always appreciated how he said that and, and that he said that. Uh, he's, well, he's still with us, but he doesn't have those witty things now as he did in years gone by as much. But this is absolutely true. Zero prayer zero power. Zero prayer equals zero power. You're not going to be strengthened in the might of the Lord if you have zero prayer. We must keep watching and praying for all the saints and for each other to stand and especially for the ministers of the word to do what they're called to do by God. And so that's the armor of God which protects us and allows us to experience the power of God in the first verses of that section. And so may it be that Fellowship Bible Church will always stand here until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that that will be the case. Would you join me just briefly as we close this segment of our the meeting? Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to be found standing at the end. And Lord, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, may we, Lord, be found to have lived a life worthy of the calling with which we have been called, worthy of the kingdom of God, for which some of us have suffered, and many of our brothers and sisters around the globe. Lord, we're not even worthy to be counted sons of God, much less counted in that number of people who have given their lives and sacrificed and, and taken such beating and taken it on the chin for the gospel. But Lord, we thank you that in Christ Jesus we can participate with them in that great throng that will sing praise before your throne. And Lord, like the Apostle Paul, we pray that you would help each one of us to labor according to the working which works in us mightily by the Spirit of God, to perfect every person in Christ Jesus, that they would be able to stand complete and mature in all the will of God before that throne at that day. Lord, help us to be faithful. Not so much worried about how many or how much money or what kind of variegated activities we can be involved in and how much we can do, but that we would stand. And yes, while we stand, we would accomplish things for you as well, but just in the very act of standing, that is an accomplishment, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, that brings us to the end of our message.